<laughs> and log on. Welcome, uh, Kevin Mills. Thank you. Thank you for doing this presentation of uh, some new concepts to me. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the maker movement. And, and uh, would you say adventure playgrounds are kind of a subset of the broader maker movement? Well, that's that's what we're going to talk about. That's what we're going to talk about. Where they, uh, where they meet. All right. <laughs> Yes, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Kevin Mills, for those of you that don't know me. I uh, don't ignore the name tags. <laughs> name tags. Yeah. Lying. Got it. <laughs> don't be distracted by it. <laughs> 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 a lot of movement. <laughs> I um, have to be here. I'm grateful for my new ABC friends. I'm an industrial designer and the former director of exhibit design and fabrication at the Children's Museum in Tucson. I um, resigned from that uh, dream job just last August of last year after six very fulfilling and rewarding years there designing and building hands-on learning apparatus for kids. Uh, resigned because I arrived at something of a <clears throat> crisis of confidence when I discovered that maybe I wasn't uh, doing all I could for kids and that having, you know, drawing them inside and giving them more buttons and screens wasn't maybe the best thing for them. And I had been studying the adventure play movement and the maker movement for probably three or four years now and it occurred to me that uh, it was in my best interest and in theirs to, to join the movement and, and start exploring what that might look like. Doing, doing all I could to get them off the screens and, and back outside, playing with their hands and, and building uh, in, in the way that nature intended. And nature, <laughs> nature has selected for play consistently. It's, uh, in fact, one of the most important things that we do developmentally. <laughs> it's where we learn collaboration. It's where we learn empathy and collaboration. And it's mission critical to our healthy development. We think of it as somewhat frivolous and, and we tend to even marginalize it. But in fact, it, uh, it couldn't be more essential to our healthy development. It's where we acquire all of our life skills. And Regrettably, it's been terribly marginalized. <laughs> much, much has been lost just in one generation due to a variety of factors, but most notably these really enticing new shiny toys that we're all pretty hooked on. Um, that combined with some, some fanatical overprotectiveness, <laughs> which is really uh, heartbreaking, especially given that, as it says here, new research shows he'll grow up to be more fearful and less creative. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and that, uh, from a business standpoint, is, is not good because we know that the future leaders are going to need to be the creatives and the innovators and the risk takers. So we're really shooting ourselves in the foot by not engendering the healthiest kinds of play that, that most of us here grew up with. Play turns out to be so stunningly essential, in fact, to childhood, it's like love, sunshine, and broccoli all juiced together. <laughs> yes. and that's a quote from Lenore Skenazy, and if you recognize her name, it's because she was thrust into the court of public opinion and dubbed the worst mom in America several years ago, a few years ago, when she encouraged her nine-year-old to take the New York subway to school alone every day. And she came out swinging and is still swinging and launched the free range kids movement. <laughs> and in fact, it, my, my large, largely the reason for relocating to Bainbridge was because when I, I was vacationing here in the summer of 14, I witnessed so many free range kids. And I thought, well, okay, here's a community that's going to be receptive to these ideas. I'm a 
materials. I've been accused of being a born industrial designer because I've always had this, this really healthy materials inquiry going on. I love materials and their properties. And I'm, uh, when I was 10 years old, one of my Saturday morning chores was to crush the aluminum cans that the family had generated to consolidate them for recycling. And, and took my pocket knife to an aluminum can and just to see what it it could do and was delighted to discover that it was pretty easy to cut the top off of one and, and very surprised to find that, that one would yield to another and you could telescope them together and stretch the aluminum and, and I, I wound up with this airtight vessel like a pontoon and one thing led to another. And that was the beginning of the maker movement. <laughs> was the, that was absolutely the beginning of me as maker, yeah. Because, that led to this motorboat for the swimming pool and what eventually became really the most joyous weekends of, of my childhood life. Racing my bike back and forth to Radio Shack, getting new parts, putting more batteries on it, tormenting the motor even more, making a bigger propeller. And I share that with you um, as an invitation if, if you're anything like me, when a presenter gets up and asks you to close your eyes and visualize, you tend to roll your eyes. Uh, so do whatever you want with your eyes, but if, but if you will reflect for a moment on your fondest childhood play memory, and, and then I would ask for a show of hands, uh, how many of you were outdoors for that? Almost everyone in the scene. And for how many of you, was there a grown-up present? No. <laughs> Interesting. No one. So that, that's a device that um, we play advocates use, really as a recruiting tool to just elicit an empathetic response in you. Uh, if I have any agenda here today, it's not to advance my business, because my business has yet to be formed. I'm still a one-man exploratory committee looking at what the options and the opportunities are here on the island. And as I get more specific in the presentation, I would ask only that you that you draw on that sense of memory and and feel for the kids of today who are being denied that. What? How would your personal character differ today had you not had those experiences? Had you been overprotected and indoor with screens the whole time? And this is. The, I feel like we have a moral imperative to address this situation. So. Some background about me and my career and my love of materials. There's a, there's a common thread throughout the, the presentation that it has, it's all about materials and, and Gore-Tex was my first material as a professional right out of college. Gore-Tex is Teflon and I had the privilege of designing some of the instrumentation for manufacturing vascular graphs and learned a lot found that to be rather sterile and antiseptic, as you might imagine. Good. <laughs> good. Good. Okay. Good. That's good. <laughs> and uh, found myself designing Learjet interiors, which of course was very sexy and very glamorous, um, and a little more creative, but uh, still pretty corporate and, uh, and not terribly fulfilling. And at some point, raised the courage to declare myself a studio artist uh, and created a line of high-end, bespoke, contemporary light fixtures and did rather well with those for, for some time, and this, uh, even before Etsy, mm -hmm. despite not having a marketing bone in my body and being a, a, a card-carrying introvert. <laughs> <laughs> so that was very fulfilling work because now I was working with what are called noble materials, and uh, which are Metals, wood, glass, just the, the traditional, the classics. Oh, it's not the tree. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and found myself designing museum exhibit tree along the way. And I, I chose this slide um, in particular because I think this uh, was a bit of a turning point for me. I accidentally designed something for children and, and was witness to how fulfilling that was. We, we did this Trump Loy technique with 2D and 3D to draw people in and 
this scene from a distance from the lobby at check-in looked like a real backhoe once it was properly lit. And the kids would run to it thinking that they were going to get to climb on a real backhoe. <laughs> we're a little bit disappointed, but this is a real backhoe bucket, which I was responsible for anchoring to the floor in such a way that they could safely climb on and play inside that. And that was a real payoff for them and, and for me. And, and I think that helped me to get closer to my, my aspirations. Um, I had a burning desire to work outside and take the work outside and did some landscape architecture for a time. Uh, I had a client who wanted to make a big loud green message at a trade show expo in Munich, Germany and designed some cardboard and steel chairs for her that won a lot of praise for their, their novelty and their strength. Cardboard was one of the last materials at this point that I felt um, I hadn't yet worked with, so that was very rewarding and satisfying. And uh, I aligned the grain intermittently so when we stood in front of the chair, we'd be looking through the corrugations of the cardboard and select stripes. And, it was a lot of fun. and at some point, I had the privilege of designing and installing a permanent bronze monument at the Hoover Dam Visitor Center. Thank you. And much of the copper was donated by the, the power authority and from from obsolete power systems and we melted that down and cast it into the new letters and, and we used the reverse molds for the bronzes, the plaster molds in negative for the back sides of this piece that's called the bronze turbine. Mm -hmm. Kevin, is that the new one? Is that that new bridge? Yeah, well, the this was the new visitor center at the time. This, this room is this overlook here. The bridge is over here. Yeah. Yeah. Bridge. eventually arrived at the Children's Museum of Tucson in this beautiful, historic, 112-year-old Carnegie Library, former Carnegie Library. And um, it was in a whole new world, to say the least. And yes, those are nose hairs. <laughs> and there's boogers in there, too. <laughs> and so from a material standpoint, I, I was in this surreal new landscape. The mouth there on the end has a uvula in the back, and the uvula takes some real hits. In fact, yeah. everything takes extraordinary hits, it turns out. This was the fifth generation uvula. <laughs> Kids rock. So the learning curve was steep, to say the least, and the pressure intense because children's safety was in my hands. 125,000 kids a year, me and a part-time guy responsible for building and maintaining all this hands-on stuff. A lot of these kids were completely unsupervised and making up for lost time. <laughs> so I developed a whole new palette of materials and techniques and, and quickly formed this library of materials that I would draw on to solve these very unique problems. And once I was up to speed, I was a kid in a candy store having the time of my life. I heard myself telling people I may never leave this job. This is so much fun. I was, uh, I was literally jumping out of bed in the morning in the development on this project. It, as far as I know, it's the only one of its kind. Uh, it plays off of the PVC gravity-fed ball wall that any self-respecting children's museum has, but raises the bar aesthetically and demands a little bit more fine motor skills from a slightly older child. They, they position these leaves on this metallic wall, magnetically held, and create pathways and then feed the ball chain through. And I got to design planetarium chandeliers with working moons and breathing aspirators that are $16 fishing reels <laughs> really got into my element. This is a Jacob's Ladder that makes that Frankenstein spark that goes up the tree. Three, two, 
destroy that. <laughs> because you can redesign something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the crown is a completely gratuitous and unnecessary uh, aesthetic treatment that looks like it has something to do with the electronics, yeah. but it doesn't. <laughs> and a, uh, a steampunk airship. Oh, yeah. With a lobby reception makeover. Like every self respecting lobby has. <laughs> if you're not familiar with steampunk, they have a nice example there on the wall. It's, it's actually steampunk light with a touch of the Greek. <laughs> and some really over the top, hands on, interactive, high end games. I uh, really indulged myself on the materials front on this one. It's $4,500 interlocking laser cut acrylic and programmable LED craziness. And, wow. and it was right about the time I was completing this that I was starting to have this crisis of confidence and, and some reservations and I couldn't really put my finger on it. And uh, later realized, as I said in my introduction, I wasn't wasn't doing the kids any favors because right on the heels of that, uh, the other directors and I saw the wisdom in repurposing one of the galleries uh, as a loose parts gallery. And we purchased um, most, if not all, of the available kits on the market for indoor loose parts play, and they are few. Uh, the Adventure Playground blocks, the blue blocks there, were developed by David Rockwell, a noted architect in New York, who was frustrated by the fixed playground offerings for his kids. So he worked with Kaboom, uh, a nonprofit who developed those, Rigamajig and Thinkerlinkers. And, the, uh, and then we just stood back and watched. And it was, it was pretty unorthodox because it was, it was messier than we were accustomed to and what the parents were accustomed to but the kids absolutely devoured it and this whole new dynamic emerged. Because the theory states that in any environment, both the degree of inventiveness and creativity and the possibility of discovery are directly proportional to the number and kinds of variables in it. And these really delightful, <laughs> these, these magical moments started to happen and they would cross purpose these materials in the most unexpected way. And this, this gentle dynamic emerged that it wasn't nearly as crazy and urgent and, and frenetic as it would be in other parts of the museum. And so we were all starting to see the wisdom in the loose parts movement and adventure playgrounds and loose parts are almost synonymous, they're, they're one and the same. And I'm thinking, wait, loose parts? Materials that, that rings a bell. I'm, I'm all about these parts and raw materials. And this is this is the state of the art thinking about what's best to do for kids. I need to get in on this action. And so I did. And I, uh, with with materials I had on hand, I, I developed and am still developing this this soft foamy loose part system that. My successor and I are, are beta testing at the Children's Museum still and they're developing and we're very excited about. Those parts in Adventure Play and Pop-Up Adventure Play, something I hope to do in 2016, hold stage several pop-up events. Pop-up events are a great way to reintroduce these concepts, reintroduce play through some nice, gentle, easy, familiar, soft, safe materials uh, just for an afternoon in the park or in a gymnasium. And, uh, and I'm thinking we can probably spice it up a little bit and, and bring some materials that are maybe a little bit more interesting than just cardboard boxes, but it's important to note that the kids don't care. It's just yeah. the adults that have all these aesthetic sensibilities mm -hmm. about what it should look like. The kids absolutely don't care. And have plenty of duct tape. Right? Yeah, it's all about yeah. duct tape and, and string and sheets mm -hmm. and. Um, you have a real big laser right on. <laughs> and you can see here that somebody has you know, brought in some some more interesting materials. And we're going to 
watch a video. In the UK, they have scrap stores that I'm told the teachers rely on heavily. And, uh, and one scrap store has seen fit to create play pods. And on a subscription basis, they engage schools in securing one of these play pods. And they, they keep it replenished on a regular basis. So if I have my volume switched over to the big monitor. These <laughs> <laughs> playground toys were once something else. Shirehampton Primary School in Bristol is the 50th to get one of these play sets. Very tired. And you get to make lots of stuff. Get to use creativity and imagination. <laughs> But in days of tough health and safety rules, shouldn't toys be custom made rather than reclaimed business materials? No, says the school's head teacher. Over the last few weeks that the paper has been open, we've actually seen a reduction in the number of minor accidents that we've had out on the playground as a result of the children being far more engaged. And it's really important that as young people grow up, they're encouraged to understand risks themselves and put measures in place to ensure that they can play safely. Well, it all comes from local business. Um, some large businesses, some small. Uh, we collect scrap on a daily basis in Bristol and around the, the greater area. And um, they donate their waste rather than put it into landfill. So it saves money for businesses and it provides this huge opportunity and wealth of experiences for children. It's really an environmental and a social experiment that has just worked so well. The charity has big ambitions, wanting these kids in every school in the country. Robert Murphy for the West Country tonight. So there's a precedent, and a strong one. For seizing on uh, all, the, all the wonderful materials that are out there. Meanwhile, the maker movement, very briefly. Uh, on the surface is nothing short of a renaissance for tinkerers and do-it-yourselfers and would-be inventors, but um, its implications <coughs> are, are really quite far-reaching. And this is, this is a little bit of a, a, a slippery subject here, so bear with me for a minute. So it's 1989, and I'm standing up here selling all of you on the, the promise and the future of PCs and the World Wide Web and the fact that we will all be able to reach out and, and nearly for free access all of mankind's accumulated knowledge at our fingertips. And not only that, we'll be able to publish and add to it from our desktops. And it's going to be this thing we're calling desktop publishing, and it's really exciting. We don't really know what it looks like yet, but it promises to be huge. And, and you're thinking, well, okay, that's, that sounds pretty cool. And do, you, do you remember that catchphrase, the buzz around desktop publishing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, guess oh, what? Yeah. They're, the, the maker movement is shorthand for what they're calling desktop manufacturing. And it promises to be just as profound and game-changing for mankind. Um, what we, what, the web did for bits of information, the maker movement is doing for bits of materials. So it's the internet of things, and it's a game changer. It's going to upset manufacturing and supply chains and everything. And at the end of the day, what it means is that making is coming into the home. The making is tinkering, and tinkering is playing. Maker spaces are popping up everywhere, um, but sometimes they don't take hold. And I was sad to learn that the maker space in Seattle had to shut its doors after just a couple years. And uh, but there are maker fairs all over the world, and, and they're not going anywhere. And it's a wonderful showcase for 
for this strange, seemingly fringe culture of hobbyists and tinkerers that build outlandish and crazy stuff. And it's, it's wonderful for the kids to be able to see what's possible and meet the people that are making these things. Uh, reclaim materials, you see the tire treads there. I had the privilege of attending the 2013 San Mateo Maker Fair. And there was 125,000 people that weekend. And it's, Where did they hold that at? So now they're, they're having to break off into mini maker fairs because there's so much demand. And lo and behold, loose parts and tinkering and encouraging kids to explore through, through play. And that's fantastic. This is a typical makerspace, not unlike the one that failed in Seattle. And I'd like to offer that maybe they're failing because they're too linear, too mm -hmm. close, and they're yep. too project mm -hmm. structured. Mm -hmm. So I'm just gonna let the cat out of the bag at this point and share my vision with you, which is to create an adventure playground makerspace hybrid, or just have them be adjacent to each other so that one can play off of the other. Those are the new bits. For those who've marveled at the way software has helped disrupt industry after industry, buckle up. That wave is coming soon to a hardware industry near you. <laughs> <laughs> so at last, you get to see pictures of real adventure playgrounds. Um, and I need to warn you that originally they were called junk playgrounds, and we're going to bring our adult sensibilities about aesthetics to it. And they're really, they can be really hard on the eye, and they run the gamut, and they don't necessarily have to be. And I think if we infuse more thoughtful materials in them, um, but it's important not to adulterate. Kids love junk and can make mm -hmm. good use of junk mm -hmm. with their imaginations. Adult junk. Yeah, adulterate is a word that play workers use <laughs> to great effect. <laughs> yeah. Us out of the equation. So this is a colleague of mine, Erin Davis. She's a filmmaker. She, uh, she released a documentary short last year called The Land about the land, which is uh, easily the most hardcore of adventure playgrounds on the planet. And I'm going to show you the trailer for the land. There's a tight shot, close up of some water. Look for a tool under the water. This will be a better payoff for you. And note what they say about the Play workers.
going to page through several uh, venture playgrounds. This is Berkeley. Uh, there, there are about a thousand venture playgrounds throughout Europe, uh, several dozen in Berlin alone, around four or five depending on how you count them in the United States. Uh, Berkeley has one of the oldest, Huntington Beach is an old one. They generally rely exclusively on scrap wood, which is all fine and good, but uh, in the 21st century, with all the waste streams of exotic new remnants, I feel like we can do a lot better. And often there are artists in residence. That's one of my inspirations. And there's the inevitable concern about injury and liability, and there's nothing but good news there. Okay. Insurance carriers tell me that compared to the public swimming pools, this is this is not a thing. And statistically, they demonstrate what that school principal said that there are less injuries than on traditional playgrounds because the kids are so bored on traditional fixed equipment playgrounds that they're climbing on the stuff they're not supposed to be climbing on. They're trying to, trying to get something more out of it and hurting themselves. They're so engaged in an adventure playground minding their P's and Q's that they're not getting hurt as much. And the insurance companies are, seem to be okay with that. So good news there. We can start small. This is a version of a pop-up using natural materials, which I'm very fond of. This slide is designed to elicit your, your competitive juices and your, your sense of civic pride. This is one of those five playgrounds in the country, located right over there on Mercer Island. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just saying. <laughs> 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 the the <laughs> yeah, look at it. Competition. <laughs> and it's, it's a really commendable one. It's seasonal, summers only. It's not staffed, which is kind of anathema in the eyes of purists. It's through Parks and Rec. And they check out tool kits to the kids. And so what ends up happening is the parents are working side by side with the kids building forts, which is fantastic, of course. And purists would argue that it's yeah, adulterating but, yeah. a little bit. But you know, it's all good. Gotta start somewhere. Mm -hmm. This is Berlin. As is this. Wow. Oh. Downtown Berlin? <laughs> 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 They've just preserved the corner lot model 
-hmm. and put a fence around it and yeah. san sanctified it. So these do pop up in the works. It's improbable to go through. They're building a wall. <laughs> <laughs> to keep the grown-ups out. Yeah, yeah. Right. Copenhagen. This is Ithaca, New York, where the, oh, the oh, second oh. annual Adventure Play Symposium was held. Last year, where I shot. got to meet with the core group of, of, of advocates. Ithaca is a proud participant in International Mud Day. Oh, oh yeah. my God. <laughs> 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 Why that isn't a thing everywhere that's forested like this is beyond me, because that's so cool. And materials, materials, materials. We are all about recycling now, and we manufacture some safe, clean, soft, exciting, state-of-the-art materials, and we have remnants galore, and they're all going to where they go <clears throat> when they could be selectively curated and made safe and <laughs> tested for contaminants and, <clears throat> and warehoused and stored you know, to, to fuel these, these uh, exploration creative play scenarios. Mm -hmm. Miles of really cool stuff yeah. all day long. Mm -hmm. Those are steering wheels. Mm -hmm. Come on. <laughs> it's a no-brainer. So you may recognize this photo from uh, the Seattle Times. This is Mercer again, and this is this is a call to to arms, a rally on behalf of the kids. This is uh, this is what I see as the perfect storm of opportunity. You see all these systems feeding each other in this nice symbiotic relationship. And this is a time machine that a friend of mine made. <laughs> and we all know these guys and this art, or this found object welded together art. And it has its place in the world. And you wouldn't dare climb inside it because it's lethal and deadly and sharp and rusty because those were the materials of the former industrial age. Imagine what a kid would build with similar remnants safe, soft plastics that could be inhabited and modified and destroyed if so, so suited. Thank you for your attention. Questions? Go ahead. Um, I heard an article 10 years ago from an uh, English scientists who've written an article on the risk gene and why this article showed up on my radar because he was talking about the advent of, among other things, he was talking about the advent of um, uh, armored gear for motorcycle riding, which is something I like to do, and uh, that studies were showing that the safer the rider's gear was that they were riding, the faster they would ride. You might consider that if you're on a motorcycle and you're wearing uh, armored boots, yeah. <laughs> armored pants, an armored jacket, and a helmet, you might feel uh, more comfortable riding faster than if you were on that same motorcycle in flip-flops, shorts, and a t-shirt with no helmet. Um, and so therefore the inverse is going to be true, too. Yeah. The kids would, would perceive a, a, a threat in the form of a plank on a tire are going to dial it down and, and act much more mindfully. And when they were, what the, the other thing they were hypothesizing, which at the time didn't, wasn't as, you know, it's totally made sense was, is that in making kids were going as far as they possibly could in the extreme on these hyper safe playgrounds, mm -hmm. you know, we were hanging upside down on a, mm -hmm. on a jungle gym or 